Hello and welcome to the Tax Roundup for June. And we're steaming towards the end of the financial year. A lot of those changes that were announced in the federal budget have started making their way through Parliament. We've already seen the personal income tax changes and some of the superannuation measures. Now, in amongst that was the announcement of a 12-month amnesty to help employers bring their super guarantee obligations up to date. We're going to explore that in a bit more detail. We're also going to take a look at a new law companion ruling that looks at the travel deductions for investment properties. But first up, we have Adam from BT Financial Group's new wealth experience, BT Panorama, who's going to bring us our tip of the month. Across to you, Adam. Coming into the new financial year, it is important that you and your firm have the right systems, processes, and technology in place to ensure that your staff are spending the most amount of time on the value-add tasks and services that the firm provide. This can be done through the automation of technology and the right systems and processes in place. BT Panorama and our SMSF solution is something that can help you and your business. Your end clients will receive up-to-date and tax and investment reporting, and you as a firm will be able to spend more time and have a closer relationship with your client. Now across to Michael to explore that super guarantee amnesty. Now, one of the big items for this month is the announcement by the government of plans to introduce a 12-month amnesty period for catching up on outstanding super guarantee liabilities. Now, the super guarantee rules are quite harsh in the way they work. If you're a business or an employer and you miss your obligation in relation to employee super entitlements, then the system is designed to punish you, basically. Um, basically how the SG system works is that if you miss your quarterly deadline for making a super guarantee contribution for an employee, and remember it's a quarterly deadline, the system works on a quarter, quarter by quarter basis, then you move into the super guarantee charge system. And the super guarantee charge system is, is pretty harsh on employers and it's designed to encourage employers to meet their obligations on time. What happens in that case is the employer will still be liable for the super guarantee amount, um, but it may not be a, a higher amount um, because it's calculated on salary and wages, not just ordinary time earnings. So that base amount might be higher. You then become liable for an administrative component which accrues each quarter. There's an interest charge that applies as well, and that's basically to compensate the employee for the fact that the money's not sitting in their super account earning money. Beyond that, there's a couple of other things that happen. First of all, the ATO can potentially apply additional penalties, and those can be really harsh additional penalties. And the business loses the ability to claim a deduction for the super contribution in the first place. So as a business, if you've missed your timing deadline for making those super guarantee obligations, then the rules apply in a pretty harsh way to you. Now, what the government's doing is offering this 12-month amnesty, presumably, to encourage employers and businesses to catch up any outstanding super guarantee obligations. And again, presumably, this is all designed to make sure that employees don't miss out on their super entitlements. The whole point of the system is to ensure that employees have adequate superannuation put away for retirement. And the super, super guarantee amounts really do belong to employees indirectly anyway through their super funds. So I guess in the past there may have been businesses who might have realised that they had missed out on some of their obligations, but they may have been reluctant to stick their hand up and come forward because of the way the system works and because of the harsh nature of the additional amounts then getting imposed on the business. Now, when this amnesty kicks in, assuming that the legislation is passed, there's a bill before Parliament, isn't law yet, but assuming it does get passed, the 12-month period will start from the day the bill was introduced and will end on the 23rd of May 2019. The advantage of, I guess, taking up the opportunity to use the amnesty, um, basically there's three. There's three advantages there. First of all, the administrative component, the administrative penalty that accrues quarter by quarter on unpaid SG amounts, um, that will not be imposed. So the employer will be let off that component. The other thing that will happen is that those additional penalties that the ATO can potentially apply to employers who miss out on meeting those obligations, um, that will also be waived during the amnesty period. The third benefit of 
taking advantage of the amnesty is that the employer will be able to claim a deduction for the super amount that is actually paid on a catch-up basis. So there are potentially, from a financial point of view, some considerable benefits when it comes to using the amnesty as opposed to being caught fully under the SGC rules. Now, a couple of other things to keep in mind, I guess from a practical point of view, um, while this amnesty is running, that doesn't mean that the ATO is going to stop looking for SGC problems. If the ATO finds the problem before the business has basically put its hand up and made that voluntary disclosure and paid everything that's owed on an outstanding basis, then the amnesty is probably not going to be available to that business and they'll be hit with, I guess, the full force of the current rules. The other thing that the government has said is that if a business has existing SG entitlements that haven't been met and they do not take advantage of this amnesty period, then if the ATO discovers some SGC outstanding amounts after the amnesty has ended, then it's likely to result in an even higher level of penalties that's applied. So the base penalty amount um, will be higher than what it would otherwise be at the moment. So for businesses who might have some issues in this area, this is very much the chance to catch up and reduce exposure moving forward. One of the things that's kind of a bit hard for businesses to understand, I guess, sometimes around these rules is that there is no real time limit on outstanding and unpaid SG amounts. Technically, no time limit. Administratively, the ATO kind of indicates there's a, there's a practical time limit. It's a bit hard for the ATO to go back forever, but technically there is no time limit under these rules. So the amnesty gives the business the chance to really catch up, get things right, and then move forward on a catch up basis. Now, in terms of identifying businesses who may well be exposed at the moment, maybe don't even realise it, um, sorts of businesses that could be affected, particularly those who use contractors. Um, this is a common area of confusion and debate um, and where taxpayers and the ATO often get into arguments in terms of whether workers really are genuine independent contractors or whether they should be classified as employees. Now, one of the reasons that's a difficult thing to do in the SG system is that the SG rules have an additional deemed employee provision, basically. So even someone who might look like they're a contractor could actually be caught as a deemed employee for SG purposes. So that could have led to entitlements, super guarantee obligations, liabilities, entitlements that maybe haven't been met as yet. Also would be a good idea for businesses to make sure that they are actually paying the right amount to their staff. If amounts are owed to employees but maybe being underpaid or where simply super entitlements aren't being satisfied for whatever reason, well this is the opportunity to try and make things right, catch up, get things right so you can move forward in full compliance. Now one of the other features of the changes that we might see is that if an employee does have significant unpaid SG amounts put into their super fund as a result of this amnesty, well, there could be an issue from their point of view in terms of concessional contribution limits. Um, the government has thought of that and there's a couple of ways that potentially that can be addressed. Um, it will just depend on how the outstanding obligation has been dealt with by the employer. If the amount's been paid to the ATO and then the ATO has transferred amounts into employee super funds, then the process will be a little bit more streamlined because the ATO will be able to um, basically have access to that information and be able to deal with potentially those excess contributions made as a one-off um, in a more streamlined manner. But where employers are transferring amounts directly into employee super funds, well, if there is an issue around concessional contribution limits being breached in that year, then the individual employee will probably have to take some action and apply to the commissioner to basically reduce the, I guess, the, the penalty that arises because of that. And the commissioner does have some discretion to either reallocate contributions to different years, et cetera, in cases like that, where it's gonna be on the employee's control. So there's quite a bit to take into account here. Um, certainly the time is now to identify clients who might be affected, at least let clients know that this amnesty is likely to apply, that time is pretty limited, 12 months, but the clock is already ticking on that 12 month period. 
um, and to start to discuss an approach how to deal with this amnesty if outstanding liabilities have been identified. And that super guarantee amnesty was covered in the latest edition of Knowledge Shop's client newsletter. If you're a member of Knowledge Shop, it might be a useful tool to help educate your clients about what they should be looking at and when. But now across to Michael, who's going to explore that law companion ruling on the travel deductions for investment property owners. Now in the federal budget last year, a couple of changes were made to the tax treatment for rental property owners. Um, changes to travel expenses, so basically a denial of expenses relating to travel in relation to residential rental properties, and also some changes to the way the depreciation rules work. Now those changes kicked in from 1 July 2017, so 2018 tax returns will be the first tax returns where we see those changes actually having a full effect. Um, the ATO has issued a draft law companion ruling which focuses on the travel issue, the loss of deductibility of travel expenses for residential rental properties. Now that draft ruling covers three main areas. First of all, how to identify whether a property is a residential property that's affected by these changes. The ATO looks at the apportionment issue because it may well be that some travel is undertaken for multiple purposes or reasons. If so, we need to do an apportionment to figure out how much is deductible. The third issue that's covered by the ATO in that draft ruling is this concept of carrying on a business. And the reason that's important is because these changes don't affect you if you are carrying on a business. So if you're renting out a property in the course of a rental property business, then you can still claim a deduction for your travel expenses. Likewise, you're also not affected by the changes to the depreciation rules. So someone who is carrying on a rental property business could still potentially claim depreciation deductions on, for example, secondhand assets. So whether someone is carrying on a business or not can have a bearing on what they can claim as deductions in relation to their property. Now it's not always easy to tell whether someone is carrying on a business of renting properties. Now the draft ruling gives a little bit of guidance on how to determine that. And the ATO says there are a number of factors that would be taken into account as you would expect. The first one's pretty obvious. How many properties do you own? How many properties are you actually renting out as part of your rental activity? The ATO says you need to look at the average number of hours spent per week actively managing those properties. The ATO says they would look at the skill and expertise of the taxpayer and how they go about using those skills in managing those properties. And the fourth point that the ATO says they'll look at is the way that records are kept, a professional records kept in a business-like manner in relation to those activities. Now, none of those factors on their own are going to be decisive. You need to weigh them all up. But if you do have clients who are seeking to argue that they carry on a rental property business, then you would at least want to make sure that you have addressed those factors and probably go a bit beyond that as well. Have a look at some other factors that indicate whether someone may be carrying on a business or not in a general sense. Now, unfortunately, the ruling doesn't give any kind of practical examples around where that might go and how the ATO might apply that interpretation, but there are some examples elsewhere where the ATO does look at that a little bit. For example, the ATO's rental property guide, which gets published every year, um, it does tend to give some examples around when a rental activity may well amount to a business. So if you do have clients who are looking to make that argument, yes, it may be possible in some cases, make sure you've looked at the, uh, the factors that the commissioner has identified, plus any others, to see whether that activity could actually amount to a business. Now, just a bit of a warning on that though, you may reach the conclusion that a client is carrying on a rental property business. Um, but just be careful in terms of where that takes you from a tax point of view. So it might mean that the client is able to claim some extra deductions for travel, for depreciation, um, but doesn't necessarily mean they'll have access to all of the, say, the concessions that are in the provisions dealing with businesses. For example, the simplified depreciation rules. Even if your client is carrying on a rental property business and they meet the $10 million turnover threshold, they may well be a small business entity, but generally, Assets that are used mainly to derive rental income don't qualify for the simplified depreciation rules. So the benefit of being classified as a business might be somewhat limited. Still some benefit, but won't necessarily get you all the benefits that another business might get. 
Also, the small business CGT concessions on sale of the property. Yes, assets used in carrying on a business are normally active assets and may well qualify for those concessions. But again, there's a carve out for assets that are mainly used to derive rent. Now, position might be different if you're running commercial residential type premises like hotels and motels, but for standard residential rental properties, they typically don't qualify for the small business CGT concessions. So it is well, well worth looking at whether clients could be carrying on a business, but just keep in mind that that might only give them access to a certain level of tax concession, um, where there's other concessions that may still not be available to them. So, some draft guidance, we'll wait and see when the ATO finalises that ruling, whether there's any significant changes or not. Um, but there is some guidance in addition to what we already have in connection with that concept of carrying on a business of renting out properties. And that's the tax roundup for this month. Knowledge Shop members, don't forget to look on the Knowledge Bank for those end of financial year letters for clients and the other information that's available there. As we start getting into the new financial year, we'll roll out the new standards across the knowledge base. And if you're not a member of Knowledge Shop, then give Julie a call on 1800 800 232 and explore what's available to help keep you and your clients on top of change. See you next month.